<laughs> okay, let's start the event. I will be the host, uh, the moderator for it. My name is Halim Radwi. <laughs> I am the deputy CEO of the Harang Techno Valley holding company for the business development. I am delighted to host this session and having such a distinguished uh, uh, participant or a speaker like Art Utsiz and Isam and Amani. Uh, and thanks to Honeywell for uh, uh, for giving this webinar. Uh, just let me give you, a, a, if I can put up for the guest, uh, how can I put up? The, 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 the map of the Haran Techno Valley. This will stop other screen sharing. Can you let me open a screen? Who has the control? Dr. Hugh, you, you are the you having the control. I have the control. Yes. Do you want to continue? Yes. And I want to have uh, so many things here. But what I want is. Uh, I want to have this thing. Uh, 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 okay, forget it. Okay, so Dharan Techno Valley is uh, what where we belong. I think I can have it now. Okay, yeah. and give me a second, please. Okay, I'm sure you guys are, uh, are looking at the Dahran Techno Valley uh, map, which is, uh, uh, this is Dahran uh, Techno Valley Science Park, part of the ecosystem. Uh, can you see it? Anyone can say yes or no? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, so Dahran Techno Valley is the host for this <laughs> webinar, and we conduct a webinar on almost a monthly basis. Uh, and this is a chance for the companies like uh, Honeywell to uh, let the, the people know about the details of what Honeywell activities are in the center here in the Haran Techno Valley Science Park. Uh, a little introduction and marketing of uh, the Science Park. King Fahad University of Petroleum and Minerals through the dynamic growth of the Haran Techno Valley is an energy centric ecosystem. So this is an energy centric ecosystem because our university is also uh, energy centric and DTV ecosystem includes varied stakeholders to include KFUPM, national champions such as Saudi Aramco, so Sabic, Saudi Electricity Corporation and other technology partners and a small and medium sized enterprises. One thing about about the Haran Techno Valley, it supports Saudi Arabia, supports Saudi Arabia's ambitious vision 2030 of establishing a knowledge-based economy. One more, more important thing is that the Haran Techno Valley company is fully owned by King Fahad University of Petroleum and Minerals, but still we work at an arm's distance. We have our own board, we are company, we have our own uh, operating model and our own business model. Uh, the, the heart of the DTV ecosystem is this DTV Science Park, which now has a total of 18 multinational technology centers. The, the centers here are not head office or a customer care center or, or, or a business model. They are all technology centers, which are supposed to develop technologies uh, uh, along with the university faculty, researchers, graduate students, and with the industry. By the way, there is no place in the world currently, except the Haran Techno Valley, where these research technology centers of giant companies are under one roof. And if you look into the names, we have big names like Shalambarje Center, Halliburton, Baker Hughes, Weatherford, Yokogawa, Air Products, Schneider, Honeywell, Emerson, and others under one roof. 
So far, the total number of professionals working in DTV science parks are up to 1,432, 1 with nearly 50% of overall civilization. And also, a quarter of them are females. They are not secretarial staff. They are engineers, PhDs, scientists, and researchers. Just in 2020, if you look into the performance of this center, we have the outcome of, of it, outcome from the center is novel work carried out in DTV. 62 patents are filed, around 160 new technologies were developed. And these are commercial companies, so they don't, well, they don't put every, everything in the patents because of their proprietary, but the technologies they develop are there to market their business. There are around 300 R&D collaborations were made with university, with industry, not only with KFUPM, but with KAUST and other companies. There are more than 150 students who were trained and a similar number of Saudi nationals were recruited by these companies. And this training is the co-op students, summer training and others. There are some other significant achievements that DTV has got in such a short span of time which includes the hydrogen fueling station, the first of its kind in Saudi Arabia, right here in this facility. And the first supercomputer right on top here, established by STC, which has a Cray supercomputer. The success of DTV will have a far more reaching effect once the under construction KFUPM business park, which you will see on the way to Saudi Aramco, the huge buildings, the high rise buildings, which uh, house uh, high-end offices, residence, retail, hotel, conference center, which will, which will have a startup in 2023. With this, uh, I'll move forward. Uh, the, uh, the rules of the game here are that I will introduce uh, the first speaker. And the first speaker is, who is the first speaker, Amani or Isam? Uh, me, Amani, yes. Yeah. Okay, Amani is going to, ladies first, is going to be the first <laughs> speaker. Let me introduce Amani, and then Amani will introduce Isam, and then Isam will uh, introduce Art. We will have question and answer. So there are two modes of question and answer. Number one is that you can write in a check, chat box, or at the end of the webinar, you can raise your hand and, and ask a question. Uh, this session will take about 40 minutes, what, 35 to 40 minutes and then 10 minutes. We promise you that we will let you go by three, by four o'clock. Uh, Honeywell is generous enough to provide uh, us the opportunity to record, record this session. So those who are interested in getting the recording can ask for it. And uh, with the permission of Honeywell, we will uh, pass it on. That's all about it. Dr. Nag, did I miss anything? Okay, if not, let me introduce Amani. Her full name is Amani Al Sheikh Mubarak. She is currently the transformation manager of Honeywell Corporates in Saudi Arabia. She is handling localization and government relations for the company in the country. Prior to her current position, she had several years of experience working in leading position to support localization and empower Saudi manpower in the large global national companies such as ELM, Saipem, and Saudi Aramco and others. She holds a master's degree with honors from the University of Akron in 2015. Akron is in Ohio. I think that's the one, one of yeah. the famous school for polymers. Uh, uh, exactly. Yeah. But you are not a polymer girl. You are. A, yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> But I'm, I'm the colleague for them. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm a polymer man. That's how I know Echo. Oh, uh, okay. The last thing is that Amani is active assisting the development of the local resources, resources to support international companies. So Amani, the floor is all yours. And now you take over for also introducing Isam at a later stage. Please go ahead. Thank you so much, Dr. Halim. Thank you. Uh, I will start first sharing my screen. Um, can you just please, Dr. Halim, stop sharing so I can go? Uh, I think I closed it. Where am I? Okay. Uh, 
There is a small red button. Stop sharing, I think. Yes, I think. Go ahead, Amani. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay. Yes. You can see my screen? Yes, we can. Very good. Okay. So, uh, hello again, everyone. Uh, this is Amani Al Sheikh Mubarak, and I'm honored to have you with me in this session to tell you about our international company Honeywell. In this session, I have my colleague Art and Rasam Al Amdi. During the next hour, me and my colleague will take you on a journey starting from an overview of Honeywell, moving to our strategic business unit and our residence in Saudi Arabia. And then my colleague Rasam will take you in a deep view in Honeywell Process Solution. And our expert colleague, Art, will take you on UOB Research Development Center in the Han Techno Valley. A Honeywell Overview. Honeywell is a US company founded 115 years ago in 1906, our headquarter in North Carolina. We're in Saudi Arabia, our headquarter is in Riyadh. We have around 825 offices around the kingdom and globally. Uh, our Saudi Arabian Research Center located in Bahrain, Tikibad. Our business distributed actually in four business groups mainly. The first one is airspace, where our systems are used in commercial and military aircraft around the world. Second one is the building technology, where our goal is to create safe, um, energy efficient, sustain and productive environment and more than 10 million building around the world. The third one is the BMT, uh, we call it performance materials and technology, where our digitalized and support industry around the world. The last one, the fourth one actually, not the last one, is safety productivity solution, SPS, where our improved enterprise performance and worker safety and productivity. Finally, is Honeywell Connected Enterprise, where we offer a high and deep technology solution to our customers. Our sales last year, around $33 billion. A little bit about airspace. Airspace as a business group is basically focusing in developing solution for the aerospace sector or uh, defense sector. Our business portfolio includes electronic solutions, engine and power system, mechanical system and components, and others also. There is also technology includes air and thermal management, aircraft connectivity system, integrated service, autonomous flight detect and avoid system, and others. For the HBT Hannibal uh, building technology, <clears throat> HBT is a transforming the way every building operates to help improve the quality of life and offering solution for commercial building that includes building management system, uh, fire and life safety, commercial security, building projects and service. And also our technology in this sector include healthy building solutions, building control system and others. For the BMT, the performance materials and technology, BMT work in automation control uh, at a complex industrial facility. BMT also um, a huge business. Uh, she has a huge business portfolio, include Hannibal Advanced Material, Hannibal Process Solution or HPS, and Hannibal UOB. Their technology extends to chemical and electronic materials, uh, process technology equipment, and service also as a service for fuel and petrochemical, uh, safety system and instrumentation and also others. SBS, uh, SBS mainly working to make supply chain faster and more efficient and worker more productive and safe. Our business portfolio includes Honeywell Integrated, Honeywell Gas Analysis and Safety, Honeywell Personal Protective Equipment, um, SPS technology also includes automation and material handling solution, voice director worker productivity solution, and others. For Honeywell Connected Enterprises, 
or HCE. HCE is the SPU that drive innovation and manage Honeywell digitalization technologies. At the forefront of this technology is Honeywell Ford. Honeywell Ford is a platform that collects data, evaluates it using embedded algorithm, summarize that data in customizable dashboards, and advise recommended actions. Ford provides remark insight to the operator for the manager and the executive and approve optimization speed and productivity. Ford pay for itself in very short time. It gives real-time information and also allows if and this is the future proof investment. HCE or Honeywell Connected Devices is the newest Honeywell SPU and consists of about 3,700 employees and half of them are devoted to technology development. Ford is a proven technology and has been implemented in several thousand manufacturing sites, building and aircraft. This is just a highlight about this SPU. More detail will come with my colleague Isam later in his session. For Honeywell in Saudi Arabia. Honeywell in Saudi Arabia operates a wholly owned entity and also three joint ventures, Riyadh and Jeddah and the Eastern Province that support the broader region. We have in Saudi Arabia more than 600 employees. <coughs> For the GV, we have, as I mentioned before, a three GV, uh, HTAL, uh, that starts 1979 and includes uh, HPS process solution and HPS building solution and HTSI. The second GV is OMSA, which started in 1980 and includes our Zahran R&D Center. The third one is Elister, where they work in design, manufacturing, supply and commission of pressure regulation and gas metering station. We are in Honeywell fully committed to Saudi Vision 2030 and Aramco Activa program. Before 2018, our approach toward localization and support local economy was limited. However, since 2019, we increased our fourth brand locally by establishing more opportunity and create more value locally. I will take you deeply in this in my second slide. So in Honeywell, we are really committed to Saudi Arabia ongoing effort toward achieving localization goals. In local training, for example, and development, we are committed to encourage and contribute to local professional skills and development. Through our establishing automation college, Honeywell Academy also in Bahrain and Riyadh that both professional technical skills and address the challenge of this industry. And also there is Honeywell facility in Bahrain Techno Valley has a research development center with a state of the art integration and training center that benefits customer all, of the, all over the region. Honeywell UOB has been collaborating with Aramco and KFUBM, a research and development project. We lease operate and manage uh, an advanced catalysis research lab in the KFUBM Research Institute at the Center of Re Research Excellence in Petroleum Refining and Petrochemicals. Finally, and broadly, I can sum up my part of the presentation with the four remarks that make 2020 is a very successful year for Honeywell in Saudi Arabia specifically. The first one, that we sign an AGV agreement between Saudi Aramco and Honeywell for the Blend Digital. It is, this GV is the next generation digitalization technology strategy. It will be a partnership between Honeywell and Aramco to explore the key development and commercialization of next generation digital technology solution. It's designed to help improve productivity sustainability, and operation excellence of industrial company on a global scale. The GV also will serve a software system integrator to reduce time to value for the customer. The second remark, signing a partnership with SABIC of Home of Innovation Exhibition in King Saudi University in Riyadh to present the high end of Honeywell Advanced Technology Solution. The third one is the launch of Honeywell SBS gas detector facility in the MAM this year. 
Last and not least, Hannibal Earthquake signed and a secure AGT 1500 debug deal with the local company. The agreement supporting by the GAMI, the government authority military in this year, to localize Hannibal AGT 1500 repair and overall capabilities. Thank you for your attention. And now I am moving my presentation to my colleague, Sam. Please, Sam. Thank you very much, uh, Amani. Uh, let me start by sharing my screen. Amani, you did not introduce this, huh? That's fine, uh, Dr. Halim, I'll, I'll, I'll handle the introduction. I really appreciate it. No, no, I want to have a, a money the pleasure of introducing <laughs> you, particularly, particularly when she will say that you are a KFU PM graduate. Exactly, yeah. So I think I'll, I'll, I'll reach to that point in a minute. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> ah, okay. okay, so thank you very much, uh, Amani and uh, Dr. You. Halim. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, first off, I would like to thank DTBC um, and the KICS uh, team for organizing this uh, event. I'm really excited to be back to KPUPM. It brings back uh, so many good memories. Um, first of all, allow me to introduce myself. I graduated from KPUPM. I'm uh, currently serving as a strategic account leader with Honeywell. Um, I have been serving the oil and gas industry for the past 14 years with main focus um, on digital transformation technologies and solutions. I have been leading Honeywell's technology positioning and deployment, um, working closely with our customers um, in Saudi Arabia. Um, actually, uh, back in KPOPM, I was majored in uh, control and instrumentation uh, system engineering. So all uh, control system guys, uh, here we go. Um, in my session today, I'll uh, give you a brief introduction on Honeywell Process Solution. Um, and later on, I'll uh, touch on some of the selective advanced uh, technology, which I believe uh, uh, would be very interesting uh, for the audience to learn about and uh, these technologies we are deploying and uh, we are localizing uh, in Saudi Arabia. Um, so Honeywell Pro Solution um, is a pioneer in automation, uh, control, instrumentation and services across many industries. We help industries around the world operate safe, reliable, efficient and more profitable production facilities. Our technologies is actually uh, the primary control systems for more than 50% of the world's refineries. And our system is responsible for generating transmission and distribution of energy uh, to 160 plus uh, million homes and buildings and commercial industrial facilities across the world. Um, moving on. Uh, Honeywell has a great legacy actually that started in 1957 with the introduction of its first computer. Uh, which is called uh, Datamatic 1000, which actually used to occupy a full building floor, as you can see in the picture on the left-hand side. And this system uh, uses uh, vacuum tubes and actually required more than 32 people uh, to operate. Um, in uh, 1975, HPS introduced its first industrial control system, which is called TDC 2000. And since then, uh, HPS has been pioneering the process automation control uh, for over 45 years now, uh, with continuous evolution uh, from legacy process control systems um, uh, until today's uh, innovations such as uh, Experion PKS, um, which is our leading uh, automation system or distributed control system and um, some new technologies which we introduce in the market such as Hive, which is a sort of a virtualized industrial control systems uh, of the future. Actually, in 2020, Honeywell introduced um, the world's most powerful quantum computer. And we keep on discovering new ways um, uh, to enhance uh, the industry uh, going forward. OK. So HPS is, is actually organized into six lines of businesses. Uh, with each uh, having focus on a specific function. For example, uh, we have dedicated team for projects and automation solutions. We have dedicated team for process measurement um, um, and control uh, uh, systems. We also have dedicated team for life cycle and aftermarket services, which offer a comprehensive life cycle services to ensure 
um, uh, more productive and stable and sustained um, operations for industrial sectors. Um, with, with this setup, we are actually uh, able to give unparalleled industry experience um, and uh, support. Um, actually, in terms of uh, technologies, we are able to offer um, an enterprise-wide solutions. I mean, we offer leading technologies from the plant floor and machine sensors and transmitters all the way to decision-making boardroom and dashboards and uh, supporting taking executive uh, decisions. Um, all of these while maintaining solid cybersecurity and actually our cybersecurity is embedded within our entire portfolio. So each system we develop is actually developed based on the latest cybersecurity standards and uh, it's actually tested and proven in the industry to, to be prone to uh, 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 cybersecurity uh, risks. Um, HPS has a global expertise and breadth uh, of localized resources to execute projects of every size and complexity, uh, whether this is in oil and gas, refining, pulp and paper, power generation, petrochemicals, and etc. Now, even now we are getting into life sciences and uh, pharmaceutical uh, um, industries uh, and also renewable. So uh, we have the, the technologies that allows us to uh, penetrate these industries and to uh, support uh, uh, this industry uh, to grow. Now I'll move on and I'll um, touch a little bit on some of the technologies, which I believe is interesting. This is one of the solutions we called Rebellion. Actually, Rebellion is an acquisition that Honeywell uh, uh, acquired in, uh, in 2019. Uh, Rebellion is basically uh, a platform for intelligent automated visual monitoring solutions. So it's actually uh, used to detect and visualize gas cloud. As you know, um, when, when we have a gas leak, uh, that occurs, um, we will have to act immediately. Uh, and this is for safety of personnel uh, in the site and also for, for environmental um, reasons. Uh, Rebellion actually provides the personnel with the reliable intelligent information about the gas leak, including the type of the gas, the size of this gas cloud, and also the direction of, of this gas, where is it going? And this is very helpful during the evacuation. So the operation team will have a direct visualization of this uh, gas cloud as it actually released uh, into the air. And you can see the video uh, up there where you have a couple of people on, on this platform and they are releasing the gas. This actually was part of um, a factory accept a site acceptance test for the solution. Um, uh, and and uh, you can see uh, in the video down there uh, actually this is uh, taking a picture from a very far away location. So the camera is actually located in a far away location. Uh, actually, uh, the long range uh, uh, camera can detect up to 1700 meters. So are we talking about over uh, one and a half kilometers away? And this camera is able to actually rotate. So um, in one of the implementation, we are actually able to monitor a pipeline uh, of more than 20 kilometers away because now the camera can actually uh, move 180 degrees from right to left and can monitor the gas leak. So if you can see in the bottom uh, picture, this is how um, uh, the, the video feed will go to the operation team where they will actually be able to visualize in real time how the gas cloud is actually forming. It will give you also some indication about what type of gas is this. And we are able actually to distinguish different gases. So if there is a mixture of different gases that's released in the environment, we are actually able to distinguish between them. This is not just a camera. I mean, if you look into the box, inside this camera, we have a 12 cameras, and these are not just typical cameras. They are what we call spectral cameras. And uh, we have developed a patent where basically we can overlay these different uh, 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 pictures in order for uh, uh, the team or the operation team to be able to detect and visualize uh, this gas, uh, gas leak. Also, we are able to do some quantification. So over time, we can measure uh, uh, the emissions of a specific location or a specific uh, plant. So this is uh, uh, the first technology. Now move on to the second technology. 
Okay, so this is what we called intelligent wearables. Um, in the, some of the industries, they refer to it as digital helmet, or some uh, they refer to it as smart helmet. This is basically a head-mounted computer that uh, a field uh, uh, personnel will uh, uh, implement uh, on his helmet. So it's, it's a wearable technology. And uh, it has uh, this uh, uh, display, which is when you put it closer to your eyes, it's like you are looking into a seven inch this, uh, tablet. Um, and it has all the features that you would um, um, uh, expect from uh, uh, a latest uh, Android uh, mobile device. So it has, you know, all of these GPS, wireless, Bluetooth, uh, functionality, cameras with flash, of course, and it's battery operated. And if you can notice, there is no way to control this except with your voice. So this is actually a voice operated device. It actually has eight uh, microphones all around uh, the device. Some of them is used to um, to get uh, the commands from uh, from the uh, the guy who is wearing it, and some of them is actually used to do some noise cancelling. So imagine if you are closer to a machine, and there's some uh, noise in the background. Actually, the system is uh, capable of distinguishing this noise and uh, take the clear commands uh, uh, from uh, from uh, the person who is wearing it. So this is an intrinsically safe device. So if, even if you are in an industrial facility where uh, there is a possibility of um, uh, an explosive gases, the system is actually certified uh, uh, to operate in, in that environment. So this is ATEX uh, Zone 1 or uh, Class uh, 1, Div 1 uh, CSA. And we are operating a full suite of applications on top of this uh, uh, device to allow for different uh, use cases and to allow for different functionality. So, we have been working, uh, for example, with Saudi Aramco since 2018 to develop some use cases. And, and the picture up there, you can see this is an announcement by Aramco. Um, and uh, uh, in 2019, that World Economic Forum uh, announced Uthmania gas plant as a pioneer in the industry 4.0. And that was one of the reasons for deployment of such um, technologies um, in the industrial environment. Uh, moving on to the next technology. Okay, so this is uh, a kind of a little bit on the other side. So um, the first technology, the intelligent wearable is where you empower uh, uh, the field operation team and maintenance team to get the knowledge. Here, we are basically trying to educate the people even before they get into the plant floor and uh, the industrial facility itself. So this is a VR training system. We call it IFS or immersive field simulator. In the industry nowadays, we uh, have something similar to a pilot um, simulator system where you know the pilot get trained on. We have something called OTS, which is Operator Training Simulator. So our people who are sitting in the control room, they get trained on different scenario and how to react if there is some uh, kind of an upset in the process and what's um, uh, the, the procedure that they need to learn and implement over time to avoid some catastrophe in the plant. However, that was only limited to the panel operator, it means the operator were actually sitting in, in front of the control uh, system inside the control room. However, what about the, fee, the people who are actually responsible on a daily basis to be inside the facility, you know, roaming around the plants, doing some activities and some inspection and some rounds around these machine and collecting some data. You need also to link this and uh, give them the right tool to be trained similar to the panel operator. So we came up with this technology where basically we are integrating um, uh, the field uh, training with the panel operator. So now we are training two people. One guy who are sitting in front of the screen, uh, observing the, uh, the process operation. The second guy who are actually, while he's wearing this virtual reality headset, is actually inside the plant. And he can perform activities similar to the one who's sitting in the panel and both people will, will be seeing the consequences of their actions to each other. So for example, if the field uh, guy who are inside this virtual environment uh, 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 changes something, or for example, closing a valve or opening or switching on a machine, immediately the panel operator who is sitting on the screen on the, on, the, on the device will be able also to see the consequences of that action. This is very helpful because now we are actually able to simulate and to train people on how to perform different activity. For example, I need to do some switch over between standby machine. 
So um, we developed this uh, solution where basically the, the system will tell the uh, technician, now you need to go to that location with voice. He can actually navigate throughout uh, the plant. And this actually is a, a, a real plant. So we take the same uh, measurements of the plant, same types of the machine, and we build it in the, into, the, into the virtual environment. And he will uh, guide them through step by step on what need to be done in order to go and, and switch over these two machines, for example, as you can see in the picture. And uh, one of the processes would, might require you know, closing some valves. So actually, he's physically moving his hand, closing the valve. And uh, the panel operator will be able to see the consequences of that. And then he can go and you know, switch on the machine, put the machine on standby, and so on. So all of these activity can be uh, practiced in a, a sort of a virtual um, environment. This is the first use. And second also, we are able to do some tests and to record the, the, uh, the results of these tests. And for example, okay, now we trained the, the field technician on what he needs to do in order to do the switch over. Now I'll test him, I'll tell him, okay, now you are in front of this machine, please perform this activity for switch over between two different machines. And uh, it will start some counter and it will measure uh, the time taken if there is any mistake that's been taken and to we'll give him some feedback. So at the end of the day, you are able to address this knowledge gap before even you get uh, this uh, uh, technician or this engineer in the actual environment. So any mistakes, it's better to happen in the virtual environment as compared to putting people actually on the ground and, and mistakes will be costly in that case. So this is a very interesting technology that we are developing. We are implementing it now in, in, in engineering center uh, in Midra with PNCSD, and hopefully, inshallah, we'll see this cascaded across um, different industry as well. Um, now, um, the last technology which I wanted to touch base on is our cybersecurity uh, solutions. And the way that we uh, implement our cybersecurity solutions is in, in two categories. So we have uh, um, um, OT cybersecurity software, and this is uh, based on our Honeywell Forge uh, platform. And uh, we, uh, in that, we offer different types of software that addresses uh, uh, many of the gaps for the operation facilities, operating facilities, uh, uh, cybersecurity. So anything related, for example, to secure remote access and file transfer, for example, if you have multiple sites and you would like to have uh, uh, securely access these different uh, sites in order to uh, have, for example, some uh, backup uh, uh, operation in case of disaster, or if you wanted to exchange some files, for example, some patches that need to be implemented on, 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 on a periodic uh, basis. So this is a solution that we can provide as part of our software. Also, we can do asset discovery and monitoring, threat detection, for example, if there is any uh, threat uh, or anybody who's trying to do some manipulation with, within the network, then the system actually is able to detect that, highlight it, and also give you some recommendation on what correction actually need to be implemented. Also, we can uh, offer some solution related to risk compliance and management. Um, also, we have some um, uh, patching uh, deployment system where basically you don't need to go and deploy the patches for each system individually. Actually, the system can take care of this. With just one push button, it will go and implement the patches, for example, or antivirus uh, definitions to multiple systems or even the, the complete plan. And uh, uh, also, of course, we can do some centralized administration reporting where basically an HQ will be able to monitor and, and audit basically different facilities and um, anything related to uh, uh, their networks. Uh, so this is basically from software side. From services side, we uh, have a full pledge of uh, um, uh, expertise here in Saudi, uh, localized in Saudi, for cybersecurity, for industrial cybersecurity to be particular. And we can uh, offer many, uh, 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 and our portfolio in terms of services has uh, lots of things that we can do in terms of assessments, audits, compliance, and training. Um, we can also uh, support, even in the initial stages, uh, to support the design and the solution architecture, uh, and also building the specifications um, uh, for the industrial sector for cybersecurity. Uh, of course, we can do also some OT network design and security. We can also impl uh, implement endpoint protection and detection that's on the uh, workstation and server level. Uh, also, we can do some situational awareness and intelligence. So, uh, for example, recently we heard about the solar winds and the, the impact, you know, that um, 
suffered in, in many uh, uh, industries across the world. So this is one of the things that we can do. Also, we do some response recovery. We have many uh, locations uh, across the globe where we have Center of Excellence for Cybersecurity. And here in the region, uh, we have one already uh, built in, in Dubai. This is basically an industrial cybersecurity center of excellence where we have experienced people uh, that has a, a background on the industrial control systems and cybersecurity altogether. And they are supporting the regional uh, 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 customers here that we have in, in, in the region. Now we are also developing another center which is going to be integrated inshallah very soon in Jubail in our uh, uh, operation center in, in, in Jubail. And this is going to be something interesting uh, for the industry uh, and also uh, for the cybersecurity in particular uh, in Saudi. Um, with this, I concluded my uh, uh, share of presentation. Uh, now I'll move on uh, the mic to Art to continue with uh, Honeywell UOP and the R&D activity we do in, in, in the Grand Technical Park. So over to you, Art. Thank you, uh, Sam. Can you uh, uh, let me take control? Art, you screen. guys are running short of time, so please. I know, I know, I will be very fast. Expedite your speed. There is no Sahir on the road. Sure, sure. Um, can you let me take control, Sam? Because I'm, it's still so you cannot. I, I cancelled, so it's now, I think, I'm shit. Can you do that now? Okay, yeah, yeah, I can do that. Thanks. Can you see my screen? Share, okay, see. Okay. So you should be able to see my screen now? Yep, we can see yeah. it. Okay, good. Uh, okay, so um, thanks, Hassan, and thanks, Amani, and thanks, Dr. Halim, for the opportunity to talk to you today. Uh, my name is Art Futsidis. Um, I'm the regional R&D director for Middle East. And today I will talk to you about uh, UOP's R&D capabilities and activities in the region. Just a little bit uh, about myself. I was, um, I was born in Greece. I, uh, I, was, I, went, I moved to the US where I did all my studies and I finished um, from, uh, I got my chemical engineering degrees from uh, uh, W. Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Massachusetts in the US. And I joined UOP in 1981, uh, which means 40 years ago. Um, and uh, I had several uh, assignments. I've traveled all over the world with UOP. And now my last assignment here for the last three years, I've been in Bahrain, in uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, and uh, I cover, I'm the, like I said, I'm the regional R&D director here. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with UOP, I would like to just give you a little bit of account what UOP is. Uh, UOP in a nutshell is a technology provider for the oil and gas industry. Um, they, uh, uh, technology provider means that we license technology. We provide basic engineering, uh, catalyst, special equipment and services. UOP is an icon in the industry. Uh, it was founded about more than years ago uh, and uh, produced or uh, uh, basically developed most of the refining petrochemical intermediates and gas processes that are being used today. You know, here there are some kind of superlatives of UOP. Uh, there, there, we have more than 4,900 to about 5,000 patents and applications. Uh, we're the large, largest uh, process licensor in the world with 31 out of uh, and 31 out of the 36 refining technologies that we use today were initially developed by UOP. Um, UOP lines of business, uh, just really briefly, UOP has uh, five main business lines. One is the process technology and equipment, which basically licenses uh, grassroots projects or uh, revamps. Then there is the catalyst and adsorbents and specialties, which uh, it uh, sells catalyst and develops new catalysts and absorbents. Uh, then we have the gas pro uh, processing and hydrogen, which deals mainly like the name says, uh, gas and hydrogen production. Um, we also have a business that looks after renewable energy. And uh, finally, as uh, it was talked about before with uh, Honeywell Forge, 
UOB participates uh, using the Honeywell Connected Plant, which basically allows, um, uh, to, it has software which allows to take data from the plant and uh, using algorithms, uh, go back and provide like uh, advice to uh, operators, managers and executives alike. All of these five businesses are supported by a strong R&D department. And, you know, speaking about R&D specifically, um, you know, uh, R&D is very big in UOP. Um, R&D and innovation is uh, central to UOP's business plans. Uh, what, like we say, our motto is innovate or perish. Uh, basically for a technology provider, if we don't have strong R&D programs and innovation, continuous innovation, we will not survive. So we use a pool of uh, over two and a half thousand engineers um, and scientists. Um, there are, we're very uh, much diverse in terms of nationalities. I'm one of the examples. Uh, there are people who come from 50 different countries. We have employees uh, who have at least 420 employees with uh, at least uh, one patent and uh, 12 that have more than 50 patents. Um, there, we have 150 pilot plants and uh, spread over different eight different sites globally. And um, we have proprietary equip, uh, Combican tools uh, that allow us to, to do material discovery, invent new catalysts and adsorbents, uh, membranes. Uh, and also we work on process optimi optimization, scale up proprietary equipment and modular plant division. So that's, you know, I try to help it very quickly, but uh, that's what uh, UOP R&D is. Now here in Saudi Arabia, UOP has a, a pilot a laboratory in DTV. And uh, we have actually two labs. One is in DTV um, building itself, the Hannibal building itself. Uh, and the other one is the KFUPM uh, campus. And uh, our facilities here are used for both supporting local customers and also of participating in in-house R&D projects as part of uh, global teams. Our lab at DTV consists of two pilot plants, um, uh, two pilot plants uh, for absorbance testing, and we have just constructed the third pilot plant for absorption studies. Um, the lab at KFUPM includes a versatile pilot plant that was used uh, for joint project with KFUPM for the development of the toluene methylation process. Uh, UOP has a long uh, history of op in open innovation. And open innovation, what it means is that uh, the innovation that is done jointly with another party and not closed innovation, as opposed to closed innovation or um, in house innovation. In the old days, most companies used to develop uh, innovation inside the, inside the company. And they wouldn't, they wouldn't share it with anybody except uh, when it came to um, sorry, I'm coming off the course here. So, um, so in, in the past, companies used to only innovate in house, but now UOP is doing most and most most of its development in collaboration with other parties because uh, many different companies have different uh, skill sets and strengths. And capabilities, and we want to take advantage of that. Um, here, in um, I have highlighted here, and this list is kind of a list of different technologies that we have developed uh, jointly with others. And I have highlighted some of the ones which we have used here in KFUPM, um, uh, here, here in KSA. One is the toluene alkylation or toluene meth uh, methylation technology, which we developed jointly with KFUPM. And now this technology is uh, ready for, co for commercialization. Another one is uh, a project that we did jointly with Aramco and JGC. Aramco has developed their own uh, hydrocracking catalyst, and UOB helped them basically um, certify that catalyst uh, in conjunction with UOB catalyst together. The two uh, systems, the Aramco catalyst and the UOB catalyst going together, has produced a significant value in terms of yields and stability of the catalyst. And uh, this has been adopted repeatedly by Ramco in the refineries. Another program which I have highlighted here in red, and the reason I did it in red is because it's very car current. Um, it's the, the topic of uh, decarbonization and blue hydrogen. This is uh, currently a very hot topic, and UOP is actively engaged in 
uh, discussing with customers the best approach to reach their uh, decarbonization targets. So uh, UOP has uh, many technologies already developed that deal with, that can deal with uh, CO2 uh, re removal. Um, one is the, um, uh, the we use like chemical solvents or physical solvents. We also have like a cryogenic uh, distillation, cryogenic distillation, and um, uh, we have uh, PSA technologies which are based on absorption. And uh, we also have membranes, which are can be used for separating CO2 out. So um, the latest uh, technology that UOP has just uh, it's just developed, and it's about ready to commercialize. is um, It's an advanced uh, flue gas capture solvent. It's based on a new proprietary solvent for direct CO2 capture from combustion sources, like from flue gas. And uh, UOP, the team here that the team that is based in DTV um, is helping uh, in, a global, in uh, the development of this process uh, as part of a global team. And we are talking to several customers, including Anarco and others, about this uh, new technology. And this is just a, basically a glimpse of what, uh, what we're talking about. So uh, every single customer in the region and in the world, basically, they, they, they're very interested in uh, the their operations, and uh, one of the, and also another another uh, application of this is to produce blue hydrogen for for selling uh, blue hydrogen. Now, um, UOP has a complete suite of solutions for this application. When we look at uh, a refinery right now, uh, we believe that uh, the lowest hanging fruit is uh, going to uh, the hydrogen plants, the the plants that produce hydrogen. Um, this uh, flow scheme here, it's a block flow diagram of a hydrogen plant. This is the exist the white boxes represent the existing components. So you, you go through, you bring natural gas into a steam methane reformer, you produce syngas. The syngas is basically a mixture of uh, hydrogen, CO2, uh, CO, and uh, methane. Uh, you, you, you go through a PSA, which is an absorption process, you remove the hydrogen. And then the tail gas, which is the CO, the CO2 and methane, typically goes back into and burns as fuel into the steam methane and, uh, and former furnace. What uh, UOP is proposing is you can put a, an HGFS. This is an acid gas formulated solvent process, which is a solvent absorption process. You can put it either before the PSA to remove the CO2. The other thing you can do is you can uh, put it in a uh, tail gas which is the rejected gas from the PSA, and you can remove CO2. And we also here, we have a technology which is a cryogenic distillation, which basically liquefies CO2. So if you want uh, to have the CO2 in a liquid form for shipment, let's say, uh, this would be an ideal process because you can remove CO2 in a liquid form and also produces additional hydrogen, which can go back into your uh, hydrogen uh, product. Uh, these two uh, processes, I mean, they, you can either want to use the one or the other. You don't, to be, you don't use both of them. You, this is different, two different options. These two different processes are called pre-combustion. Uh, and this is uh, because it happens before the combustion of the tail gas. This process here, it's called AG, it's AGFS or this advanced solvent that I was talking about before. This is a cold post combustion process, and this removes basically all the CO2 produced uh, from the flue gas of the furnace. And this is a bit more expensive, but it can produce 95%. You can reduce the CO2 footprint of this entire operation by 95%. These two processes, because it's, post it's pre combustion, it can remove about 65% of the total CO2 produced in this uh, system. And again, the reason I saw this, this is, this is not the purpose of uh, selling this technology, but this is a very hot topic right now. And there is a lot of discussions going on with refineries. And R&D here is it's, uh, heavily involved in these discussions. And that's why I thought I will share it with the audience here. And uh, if, there, if there is more interest to discuss this uh, topic, uh, we would be more very happy to contact you individually and talk to you about this. So that's all I had for, for today. So I will pass the baton back to uh, 
um, DTVC. Thank you, thank you, Art. Uh, very enlightening presentation by all the three speakers. Now the floor is open for uh, the question answer session, Q and A. And I have the first question from Mr. Ahmed uh, Balharit. Ahmed, please introduce yourself. And the question is, what producers should do in case of gas leakage, for example, H2S, and how much time it will take? Ahmad, do you want to add something to your question? Okay, go ahead uh, to reply this question. Okay, so I'll, I'll take this uh, one, uh, Dr. Halim. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Ahmad, for this question. Uh, yes, uh, we are actually able to detect many types of um, gas leaks. Of course, it depends on uh, on the gas type and the severity of this gas. You mentioned H2S. This is one of the worst and the most dangerous um, uh, gases, which is uh, responsible for uh, many fatalities actually across the world. Um, uh, the problem is that you cannot um, smell it, you cannot see it, and um, uh, it's deadly, uh, as uh, as as you can uh, uh, imagine. And this is uh, the problem is that it it comes as associated with with the natural gas. So um, whenever there is typically a natural gas leak, H2S uh, um, uh, many of the time will be associated with, with that. Um, our system will be able to detect the leak as it starts. If there is a part, uh, if, it, if it is a part of a mixture of gases, it will be able to detect it, okay? Um, and then our machine learning um, algorithms uh, will try to identify what type of gas uh, is it. Okay, we uh, because this is basically a spectrum analysis. We have um, um, uh, learned um, uh, the different spectral emission for different gases, and hence we can um, distinguish those type of gases. However, there's some of those gases is very difficult to um, to analyze and to uh, let's say quantify the type of uh, um, that gas. H two is actually one of them, and the reason is um, um, uh, it's very difficult even to study this type of gas. Uh, so uh, to, your, uh, to answer your question directly, yes, we'll be able to detect it. Um, um, uh, what do you need to do? Of course, you'll have to evacuate the location. You will have to um, uh, isolate the location where you have the gas leak and uh, perform many activity in order to close the gaps uh, of that uh, uh, gas leak or the source of, of the gas leak itself. So the rebellion will cover the detection part of the gas leak. However, there is many things that has to happen in order to isolate and to uh, rectify the problem of the gas leak itself. Thank you, Isam. The next question is uh, from a very good friend of mine, Zohair Ghasim. He first, thank you for the nice presentation. And then the question is, he's asking is related to the gas imaging? What is the detection limit and what is the main detection technology? Okay, so to answer the second section of the question, um, actually what we do is basically uh, inside the packaging, the camera itself, there is uh, 12 uh, cameras and those some of those cameras, typical cameras, some of them are actually spectral cameras. So these spectral cameras um, are actually able to detect the emissions that goes out of any gas uh, uh, given some uh, density basically. Okay, um, and the reason why we have multiple spectral cameras is because each one of those camera will have different spectrum to basically lock into. And um, uh, our uh, algorithm basically will accumulate these different um, uh, uh, images that's coming from these different cameras. And then the machine learning will start working on identifying what type of uh, gas given the spectrum that we acquired from these different uh, cameras. So this is how, how the system actually are able to, to detect basically uh, the, the, the possibility of the gas leak, okay? Now, um, uh, again, to, for, to, to understand what type of gas it is, we do lots of uh, testing um, and, and we learn the, the, the spectral, let's say, uh, 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 gram for each one of these gases that we have tested. Actually, we have tested more than 50 types of gases, which the system can distinguish now. And um, it's actually evolving. So as we do uh, more testings, as the system actually grows in the way that actually detects different types and mixtures of, of different gases. 
Uh, I hope I answered your question. Zuhair, Dr. Zuhair, do you want to add something or the answer was clear? clear? Unmute yourself and add to it. Doctor, he cannot unmute himself, so... That's well, fine. So anyway, um, uh, Dr. Halim, I think I can share my, my contact uh, with DTBC and with the KICS team. And if you'd like, um, uh, you can reach out to me directly and I'll, I'll provide you all, all the resources uh, needed to address your question. Actually, you know what? I'll put my email here in the chat box if, I, if that's possible. Then you can reach out to me directly. You don't need to have to ask anybody. So, okay. So How right can now. I unmute? Because he, Dr. Zohair is ask, asking me to unmute. Oh, you are unmuted. Go ahead, Dr. Zohair. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Halim, for the opportunity. And thanks for uh, the nice presentation. Uh, again, my, uh, my question is about the, uh, is there a laser that uh, you send a laser and, uh, and get uh, the uh, detection? Or, uh, and what's the uh, detection limit? Yeah, this is a very, very interesting question because I asked the same question uh, to our uh, development team. Um, and they told me there is actually no laser. And I was expecting that we will, you know, uh, issue the laser beam and then we'll measure the reflection. Mm -hmm. um, um, but what they mentioned is that actually the system relies on the available uh, light uh, in, the, in the environment itself to, to detect this reflection on, on that cases. Interesting. Thank you so much, Yassam. Yeah, thank okay, you. I'll, we'll I'll, I'll move, put my uh, email in here if you'd like. You can also um, yeah, yeah. send me an email and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be happy, inshallah, to answer it. Where are you located, Yassam? Are you in DTV? Um, uh, yes, I'm actually, my office is in DTV, second floor. So I'm uh, actually, everybody is welcome. Anybody who wants to, to visit uh, DTV uh, Honeywell office, I'll be glad to, uh, to host him. No, you can also visit Dr. Zohair. He's from Definitely. the chemical engineering department. Exactly. That would be interesting, actually. <laughs> I'll do that. Why not? Thank you, Hassan. Thank you. Habibiyatikla. Now, the next question I'm seeing is from Muhammad Sultan. Muhammad Sultan, do you want to ask your question yourself? I can unmute you. Or you want me to read the question for you? If you don't reply in the next 10 seconds, 5 seconds, I will read the question. Oh, you want to be unmuted. <laughs> So where do I use unmute? Ask to unmute. Then you have to go there. No. Uh, speak and check whether you are unmuted or not. Okay. Let me read it out for you. I'm having the question from Muhammad Sultan is what products and services does Honeywell provide? in the field of renewable energy in Saudi Arabia. Okay, so I'll take this one as well. Um, uh, Honeywell uh, have a full fledge of uh, solution to offer for the, the, the renewable um, uh, industry. Actually, we can provide the complete uh, turnkey uh, implementation of up to 20 megawatt uh, plant. So everything from the solar panel uh, all the way to inverters, uh, to uh, batteries and also battery management system uh, uh, and also uh, uh, storage uh, uh, management system. So BES, BSS, BESS uh, systems, all of these things can be encapsulated. Actually, one of the key offerings which we provide is uh, a fully encapsulated uh, uh, skit uh, that has everything you need from batteries uh, uh, battery management system, inverters, everything. You just plug and play. So, for example, if you have some uh, uh, remote sites where you would like to have uh, uh, some backup uh, 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 electricity, this is a, a very quick and easy to deploy uh, solution. And if you'd like, I can share also more, more, more uh, information uh, via email. If you can send me an email, I can share with you more details. I have another question, a very detailed one from Ms. Swar Sayyid. Uh, he said, good evening, Ms. Suar Sayyid here from KFUPM undergrad EE, electrical engineering. He said, regarding blue hydrogen being produced, I'm assuming it will be mainly for export purposes initially, considering we don't really have an infrastructure here in Saudi Arabia at the moment. If so, who do you think will be the potential off-taker for the blue hydrogen from Saudi Arabia? 
Um, yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, and I, you're right. Uh, I think uh, blue hydrogen initially will be produced for export. And in fact, one of the questions to ask is like, how do you export uh, blue hydrogen? Um, it will, blue hydrogen will be very much in demand in places like Europe or the Far East, like Japan and Korea. And one of the ways we're looking at uh, exporting blue hydrogen would be to convert it to blue ammonia and uh, export the ammonia because it's easier to transport and it's also a fuel, it can be combusted directly. And uh, so we, we are uh, talking to uh, both mostly customers outside of the Middle East, but eventually Middle East will probably have to use, because together they, they have to modify the, their infrastructure to include both blue hydrogen and green hydrogen in the infrastructure. So eventually it will be usable here as well. Or it can be used directly as a fuel in, uh, instead of, for, for example, burning fuel gas, you can burn uh, hydrogen. So that's, uh, I don't know if you have any follow-up question. That's why I'd say. Fine. Any other question? We will provide the email of Art as well as Assam and Amani in case we, uh, anyone has further uh, question, he can contact me or Dr. Nag. We can pass it on to, 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 the, to the Honeywell for reply. I think we are already 15 minutes late. Thank you. First of all, the speakers, thank you, Honeywell. Thank you, uh, the audience, very good audience, very vibrant. And thank you, Kix. This is the new organization in KVPM, which is in charge of all the webinars. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad, uh, for all his effort. And thank you, all of us. Thank you to my team. And inshallah, we'll meet next time with another interesting uh, presentation. Ella. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank